<coughs> if you uh, visit a Syrian family, they will greet you with the greeting Ahlan wa Sahlan. And Ahlan wa Sahlan means you came to a family and we are easy going. So Ahlan wa Sahlan. And I'm going to be speaking today about the Syrian crisis. And you may say, why should we care about Syria? Syria is a country that is 6,000 miles away. It's a small country, size of Florida, without Disney World. <laughs> but there's a huge crisis in Syria. More than 500,000 people have been killed in the, in the last seven years. 100 and 95 people are killed daily on average in Syria in the past seven years. Huge number. We don't hear about them in the news, except when there is a chemical weapon attack. Quarter of the population are refugees. 5.5 million refugees are from Syria. One quarter of the world refugees are from Syria. We have 20 million refugees in the world. One out of four of them is from Syria. Half of the population are displaced. There is 65 million displaced people in the world. One-fifth of them are from Syria. 20,000 have been killed under torture in Syria, documented with name, with face, with pictures, with numbers. What's happening in Syria is affecting us, whether we like it or not. The Syrian, created, the Syrian crisis have created a global refugee crisis. We've seen ref Syrian refugees marching through Europe. That created anti-refugee sentiment, anti-immigrant sentiment, the rise of hate group, Brexit, and the election of some people to the highest office, including in this country. So what's happening in Syria is affecting everyone in the Western world, including the United States. I'm Syrian-American, I'm a doctor. I have family in Syria when I call my mom in the past seven years. My parents still live in Syria. I hear sometimes the sounds of explosions in the background and I ask her what's happening. She tells me, don't worry, there's nothing the usual. She's afraid to speak because in Syria we have dictatorship that torture people to death. My parents, both of them, left their home because it was bombed and it was partially destroyed. My sister left her home in the middle of the night with her two children and her husband with nothing on her except for her nightgown because her neighborhood was bombed and destroyed. My wife's cousin, she was shot by a sniper. She was killed at age of 40. She left four young children. She was trying to flee from Homs to Damascus. I have members of my family who are refugees in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Greece, in Turkey, in Egypt, in Germany, and Australia. Every Syrian that I know have the same issue. I also went into several medical missions to Syria to help the people of Syria. It's a huge crisis. I went to refugee camps in many countries. Started an organization called MedGlobal to send medical missions to disaster areas like Yemen, Rohingya, and other places. And I'd like to tell you that what's happening in Syria is affecting us. And also that it's not only bad. Yes, war is bad, and it's terrible, affecting people but also there is beauty that you see inside the war. There is beauty in the people who are suffering, and there is positive things that you witness when you go into medical mission. For people who, are, who want to be uh, physicians in the future, I would recommend that you go into medical missions. This is the best time of your life. It's a life-changing experience. I keep this drawing on my iPhone all the time. This is a drawing of a child, second grade, from the city of Aleppo. And when you ask a child to draw something, they usually dry flowers, butterflies, children playing and smiling. And this child drew helicopters dropping barrel bombs, houses on fire, children who are mutilated, bleeding, and children who are crying. Strangely enough, that children who are dead, they are smiling. And the children who are alive, they are crying. This child, whom probably you all know, Omran Daqnish, was not able even to cry. He was shell-shocked when he was pulled from the rubble of, her, of his house after it was destroyed with the barrel bomb. 
he was not able to cry in the ambulance. This child is not as lucky as Omran. This is Aylan Kurdi, who drowned while his family was fleeing from Turkey to Europe, and he was washed to the shore of Turkey, Aylan Kurdi. These are the famous Syrian children that everyone knows, but there are many other children who die and suffer on a daily basis in Syria, and no one knows about them. This is one of them whom I treated in an underground hospital in the city of Aleppo. His name is Ahmed Hijazi. He's also five years old. He was pulled from the rubble of his house after it was destroyed with a barrel bomb. He had shrapnel in his chest and shrapnel in his spinal cord. He was breathing really heavy when I saw him, so I had to put him on life support. I'm a critical care specialist that I deal with life and death every day in Chicago, but when you see a child who's healthy, who is in this condition, it's very difficult to manage these children. Unfortunately, Ahmed Hijazi died a couple of days after I left Aleppo because we were not able to transport him to a hospital that they can provide him with better health care. These are children from Douma, just a couple of days ago, suffering from the impact of chemical weapons. Imagine yourself sleeping with your family in a shelter because there is bombing, and then you start to smell bleach, and then you start to choke, and your children around you are choking and foaming and conv convulsing. Some of them will die, and the lucky of them will survive. That happened in Syria not only three times. Our media only showed us the three times, the major times. It happened 211 times in Syria. Normalization of the use of chemical weapons. War is terrible. It can affect the health in many ways. Kills people, cause disability, psychological trauma, can cause infectious diseases. We had polio epidemic in Syria. Polio was extinct in Syria for 15 years before the, the war. We had cholera epidemic in Yemen. People who have chronic diseases, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, they suffer because they cannot afford to buy their medicine. And probably the people who died in Syria because of chronic diseases are more than the people who were killed in Syria because of the war, but no one talked about them. In 1970, when Hafez al-Assad, the, the father of the current president, took the presidency in Syria, the life expectancy in Syria was 55 years. Before the war, the life expectancy in Syria was 76 years. And now, after six, seven years of the war, the life expectancy in Syria went down to 55 years. In a matter of seven years, we lost 20 years of life expectancy in Syria. The war is terrible. And there's also normalization of the violation of the rules of war in Syria. Not only chemical weapons were used 211 times, but also we had people who were tortured to death, at least 20,000 of them with pictures and names. We had people un, un, put under siege by the government and children starving to death because the government is blocking humanitarian entry to come to these areas under siege. We had normalization. When we talk about new normals, it usually indicates something in the economy, but in Syria there are new normals that we are setting very dangerous precedents. And if we tolerate, tolerate that, then it will come back and haunt us. No one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one will leave home unless home is the mouth of a shark. Sometimes we talk about refugee crisis and we try to apply some Band-Aid, but unless we address the root causes of the refugee crisis and what is driving people out of their home, we're not going to be able to address the 20 million refugees and 65 million displaced people in the world. We only can resettle less than 1% of the refugee population in the world. Why did that happen in Syria? Because people wanted to have the same freedoms that we had. And sometimes we take the freedom for granted here. Sometimes we don't vote. I remember when I was growing in Syria that I had to vote one time for the president forever. Forever. And they had to, they had to pinch my finger with, with, uh, to have a drop of my hand, and they told me you have to press here on yes. So I voted to the father of this current president with my blood 
forever. After he died, we had to vote, or the people in Syria had to vote for his son. So imagine that we have a president forever, and then after he dies, we have Ivanka. So, <laughs> so we take things for granted. People died in Syria because they wanted to demonstrate. How many of us demonstrate? You have to practice your freedom. If you do not practice your freedom, if you do not practice our freedom, we will lose them. Syrians don't want to be remembered for the origin of uh, war and refugee crisis and chemical weapons. Actually, we are indebted. The whole world is indebted uh, to Syria because Syria is the origin of civilization. If you enjoy reading or writing, if you enjoy music, if you enjoy drinking from a glass, if you enjoy colors, you are indebted to Syrian. The first alphabet was discovered in Syria. The first musical note was discovered in Syria. The first glass was discovered in Syria. The best purple color was discovered in Syria. Syria used to be called the land of purple. It was very expensive color that used to, um, uh, used to be uh, dyed for the royal families in Europe. If you don't enjoy any of that, and you enjoy ice cream, you are indebted to a Syrian American. His name is Ernest Hamwi. He was a immigrant from Syria. In 1904, in St. Louis World Fair, he invented the ice cream cone. If, if you don't enjoy any of that, pull out your smartphone. Pull it out. It was invented by this guy, Steve Jobs, who is the son of Syrian American. His father's name is Abdel Fattah Jandali. He's actually from the same city I came from. So pull out your smartphone and say, thank you, Siri. <laughs> Why do you think he called us Siri? People in Syria wanted to live. Even in between the bombing, people have to enjoy life. People are resilient, by the way, in Syria. They use the flashlight from iPhone to operate on patients because there is no electricity. They use um, they put buses on top of the building to prevent the snipers from shooting on them. They put sandbags in the emergency room to, to prevent explosions from harming the patients and the doctors. They build hospitals inside caves. This is the Central Cave Hospital in Syria. The Central Cave Hospital, I visited myself. It's amazing. But people wanted, doctors wanted to protect their patients and they didn't want to leave because if there is no doctor in town, people will leave. People can tolerate bombs, but they cannot tolerate that their son or daughter have a fever and there's no access to health care. So that's why it's important to keep doctors in town. With simple technology like this camera and satellite internet, we were able to help doctors in Syria to take care of their patients. We connected them to our doctors in Chicago and in the United States that they can provide them advice every day on what to do with their patient. So you can make, we can help patients and people to become more resilient in the time of crisis. If we want to reduce the number of world refugees, make people more resilient so they can stay in their communities. So she tripped a Syrian refugee. This guy is a soccer uh, coach from the city of Deir Zor, and he was holding his son. His son's name was Zaid, he's seven years old. His son was crying for a few hours because he has fever. And he was fleeing from Hungary to Serbia at that time, uh, from Serbia to Hungary, and this reporter tripped him. And it made the news. I don't know if you've seen it before in, on YouTube or in the media, it made the news. Because how harsh for a reporter to trip a refugee. How harsh is this? But there is a happy ending. In the, in the Islamic tradition, there is a saying that with hardship, there is always easiness. There is ease with hardship. Uh, this same child, Zaid, who you see here in the picture, uh, was received uh, in Spain with his family. And this famous football player, this is Cristiano Ronaldo, right? My wife adores him. <laughs> So he received the child and he let him play in the field in Real Madrid um, 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 
a play and he also gave him his shirt and he signed it with him. So there is always happy ending. Sometimes in the middle of storm, you think the storm will, will last forever, but there is always sun will, that will be peaking from behind the cloud at the end. I am a doctor, so when I go in medical missions, I treat patients, I do some procedures, uh, but I do a lot of other things. And the crisis will help you to develop new skills. So make sure that you're prepared when there's a crisis. And it's not a matter of when, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Every one of us will face a crisis in their life. So you have to be ready. So you have to be ready to write, you have to be ready to speak, you have to, ready to be ready to, uh, to testify in the Security Council. I did all of that, but also I was ready, um, and, and that's something that you don't learn in medical school. I smuggled things across the border. I smuggled medical supplies, I smuggled gas masks to Syria, and I smuggled this drill in the last mission to Aleppo. It was 25 pounds. So one of the neurosurgeons in my hospital told me, can you take it with you to Syria? Because I know that there's a neurosurgeon in Aleppo, he's the only neurosurgeon, and they need this drill to drain the blood from the skulls of the patient. I said, if I took it through O'Hare Airport and through Istanbul Airport, without any problem, I'll take it with Syria. And it went through, through O'Hare Airport and Istanbul Airport without anyone asking me anything. You know, this, this machine, 25 pounds. And I took it with me inside Aleppo. It was a very dangerous trip, actually. There was only one way leading to Aleppo. It was very dangerous. There were snipers. They were shooting at us. We arrived to Aleppo. I gave it to the neurosurgeon. And he received it like a baby receiving a big toy. And he used it on Fatima next day. She's two months old. She had ble bleeding in her, uh, blood, in her um, skull from the impact of barrel bomb. And she made it. So saving one life as if you save the whole humanity. And if you focus on saving lives, on touching people's lives, then you will succeed. We started with my organization called Syrian American Medical Society with one part-time employee. And we had a budget of $70,000 in 2011. By the time I left, a couple of years ago, we had a budget of $25 million. And we were able to help 2 million people inside Syria and the countries around Syria because we focus on our mission, saving lives. We can complain a lot about our country, but we have a great country, and we have to celebrate what makes us unique. What makes us unique is Thanksgiving. When I came to Chicago 30 years ago, the first holiday I celebrated was Thanksgiving holiday. So an Irish family invited me to their house, and they told me about the tradition of Thanksgiving where you Share your meal with a stranger, with a foreigner, with an immigrant. I did not care for the turkey, <laughs> but I like the mashed potato. <laughs> so this is uh, Mayor um, Emmanuel sharing a meal, Thanksgiving meal, with a Syrian refugee. We have 180 Syrian refugees families in Chicago. So open your house. What defines us as a nation is sharing the Thanksgiving dinner with a stranger not putting walls to block people fleeing from atrocities. And finally, um, I would like to mention that in my tradition, if you see injustice, then you have to change it in your hand. If you cannot change it with your hand, you change it with your tongue. And if you cannot change it with your tongue, you reject it in your heart, and that's the minimum of faith. What's happening in Syria is affecting us. Martin Luther King used to say, when he spoke about Vietnam, justice. Justice is indivisible. You cannot segregate your moral concerns. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So we have to care. There was this German pastor, his name is Neumuller. He was famous for saying, they came for the Jews and I was not a Jew, uh, I was not a Jew so I did not speak out. You, all of you probably have this saying. He was detained by the Nazis and then in 1945, he was touring one of the largest concentration camps, that Shao concentration camp, with a group of students and also faith leaders. And they saw this poster on a tree saying that between 1933 and 1945, 238,567 human beings were incinerated in this concentration camp. So Pastor Nimmler turned around to the group and he told them, I know that God will ask me one day where were you between 1933 and 1945? I think all of us should be asking ourselves, what did we do when the Syrian genocide 
unfolded in front of our eyes. Thank you very much.